Okay, so welcome and good morning to those that I haven't said good morning to yet. Good morning. My name is Carl. I'll be running through this presentation with you guys during the uh, first session um, and then handing over to Charlene, who will run you through the second part of it, which is uh, some of the VIP and um, SCBPP information. And then I'll be taking you through to the conclusion when we have a look at the Sage 300 um, areas. So just uh, a little bit of a um, housekeeping just for, for everybody's information. So we'll be doing um, four areas today. We'll be doing a general sort of overview where the most common errors are, that sort of fun stuff. Um, then we'll be moving on to the cyber and then on to the VIP and SCBPP and then finally on to the SAGE um, product, so SAGE 300 people product. So without any further ado, let's get into this and get underway. Yeah. So as I said, we'll be having a look at an overview, just a quick look at who's got to submit and all those sorts of fun things. And then we'll be moving through to um, the common problems and challenges that were faced. And then we'll be looking at how we work in Sparber and in the VIP, and then into finally into the Sage 300 people area. So for the purpose of this training, we're going to assume that you have your EMPSA or your EMP 201s or some sort of manual reconciliation that you have of the payments that have been made to SARS um, up to, whoops, and there's a date that I missed, up to February 2023. Um, so obviously this is for your tax year, so you need to have um, all of your figures that were paid away. If there were any adjustments or anything along those lines, you would need to know about those as well. You also, we're assuming that you have a basic understanding of the payroll system that you're using and that you can navigate around the system. Who has to submit? So if you're registered with SARS, you have to submit your EMP501 and um, biannually and obviously your tax certificates at the end of the tax year. So during this time, we're submitting for the full submission and um, so not the, uh, the biannual. So I'll try that again slowly. Um, obviously, very much a Wednesday morning, and we're still just trying to get there. During this time, we're submitting our 2023-02 submission, and our deadline is the end of this month, the end of May. Um, full validation takes place during the submission. And the only real difference between this submission and the interim submission is that the tax certificates if that are issued to the employees are not done on an interim. They're only done on a full submission. A reminder that your ETR claiming cycle ends, ended at the end of February and any adjustments that needed to be made from the September to February ETR um, need to be made as if it's happening in February. So if you do need to make adjustments, you do need to make sure that you have to, or that you restate your EMP 201 for February. Why do we need to prep? Well, there's always complexity around ETR on the tax certificates, on the reconciliation and all those sort of fun things. Um, ETI has become the bugbear of a lot of payroll people. And um, as a result, it's always prudent to make your preparations, make sure that you're balancing beforehand. If you can, do it on a monthly basis. Um, but at the end of the day, it's prudent to prepare all of your submission before your actual deadline. Make sure that you've done your, um, your homework beforehand. Uh, make sure that your master file details are correct. And make sure that you're, you're balancing, if you can, on a monthly basis. So when you get to the submission period, that you're not surprised, that you don't have any big surprises lying in wait for you. Uh, we can't always prepare for everything, but it's good to keep um, on track with things. Some of the areas that we can look at is things like our master file details. So you'll notice a few different colors here. So where we have blue is what we can do to try and mitigate the risk or mitigate the issues that may come up by doing our, our preparation work a little early. So don't wait until two days before deadline before you start your certificates. Where you see green, it's stuff that we can do on an ongoing basis throughout the course of the year to make our preparation work that much easier when it gets to IRP5 time. 
So what do I mean when I say master files are not up to scratch and how do we prepare for that? So ideally what we want to do is, yes, it says in the green section, is we want to get all of the required information when we're doing the onboarding or the take on or whatever terminology you use for when we bring somebody into the business. Barring that, if that's not where your area of responsibility lies or you have little or no control in that area, get your reports out early so that you have time to get the data from either the employees or line to complete the information so that you have a full data set. Remember, you only really need to collect this once and then just maintain it. So it's easier to do it over the course of a year than when you've got three weeks or four weeks left for submission or, you know, worst case scenario, you've got three or four hours left of your submission. We don't ever want to be in that situation if we can avoid it. The information that SARS looks for, that we look for in a situation is the employee name, a full first name and surname. It's common that people only put down initials on take-on forms and it gets captured like that. And then at the end of the tax year, all of a sudden you need to submit and now you need the guy's full names. Residential and postal addresses, these are a common bugbear. Um, they are frequently omitted or malformed. And by malformed, I mean that SARS has a very specific format that is required. Um, Things like the street address, the street name are mandatory fields. And if you don't have them, the validation will fail. And country code. So, I mean, it's really strange that we have to select what country we're, we're residents in, but it is one of the things that needs to be done. So, um, different payroll systems have um, country codes. ZAF or ZA is generally the, the codes. ID number and passport number. Obviously, both of these, if that person has the, the passport number, um, this has to be a valid number as well as when we enter a passport number, there are more fields that are required by SARS. And those are things like country of issue, date of issue, and date of expiry. And probably the most contentious or the, the most um, scary one at the moment is the TRA and the tax reference number. And this is the employee tax reference number. Over the last couple of years, we've noticed that the tax reference number being omitted or being incorrect has moved from being a warning to an error. And I wouldn't be surprised if that we start seeing in the not too distant future that TRNs for people who have already received a certificate from you so not necessarily the first time the person gets a certificate from you, but potentially during the course of the next tax year that you're going to start seeing administrative penalties where people don't have a tax reference number. SARS has made it the employer's responsibility to get those TRNs. However, they haven't necessarily given us the nicest tools to be able to obtain them. So if you can't get your employee to get your TRN, there are some hoops and things that we have to jump through to try and get them. Generally, the employers and third parties cannot easily get these numbers. However, SARS has recently initiated a USSD service. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, that is where you send a code via um, your cell phone. You don't require a smartphone. It can be done on any, you know, even an entry-level phone that has no smartphone. It's not, ooh. I'll try that again slowly. That has no smartphone capabilities. And there's a number of services that can be requested through this. And one of those services is to get your tax reference number. So the individual can then get their tax reference number to give to you. Yeah. We have tested this, it does work. However, the person does need to be registered. So this is not gonna be helpful for somebody who is starting new, a new, you know, not a new employee, but somebody who has not been employed before and has not necessarily registered with SARS. Um, in those cases, you will need to follow the normal steps of um, getting the person to go with to SARS to register or to book an appointment and do it um, electronically. So those are there. Um, there is a service available to be able to assist with that as well. So if you do have issues with that, feel free to contact us. So what are our common other issues that happen? Payments don't match payroll. Straightforward. It's very, you know, we, some payments have been made, but that's not what's reflecting on payroll. What can we do to mitigate? If we try and balance on a monthly basis, 
where we farm, uh, the, the, the areas will generally be easier to locate because it will be in recent memory if you're somebody who's processing the payroll. And if not, you've still got access to people who have processed the payroll, which in theory then would make it life easier to figure out where those anomalies came from. Um, if you have to do it at the end of the year, if you have no choice, um, then obviously try and do it as early as is humanly possible. The big one, ETR values don't match on the declared values. Yeah. ETR problems, uh, we can't go into the, the full level of ETR problems because they can range from something as simple as somebody's ID number ending in a zero instead of a one, and therefore it's being rejected, or alternately something far more complicated where there is SEZs involved and there's all sorts of things that just make this area extremely complicated. And the best bet for you to do here is to very carefully check your ETR on a monthly basis, preferably prior to it being paid away so that you're aware of what's being paid or sorry, before it's being claimed on your, your 201, which is then paid away to make sure that you're comfortable that the amount of ETR that you're claiming is in fact the value that you're going to be comfortable with at the end of the tax year. So moving on now to what reports and, and what extracts can we use within the payroll system to start to look at our returns and to start to, to balance them and make sure that we're fine. So we'll start off today with cyber. And our first one that we're going to look for is we're going to be looking at our master information and we want to have a look at our tax exception, the tax certificate exception summary. So this is a standard report um, and you can run it at any time to validate what information is potentially missing and what information you still need to get hold of and, and put into payroll. The report applies the SARS validation, but it's not always exactly what EasyFile is looking for. So by that, what I mean is that sometimes EasyFile has been updated or alternately your version of EasyFile has not been updated and the report is now reflecting um, validation issues that your EasyFile may not reflect. Remember that you always need to make sure that your EasyFile, um, the, the software from SARS is at the latest version at that point in time. Um, I believe the latest version um, was released just fairly recently, a couple of days ago, if I'm not mistaken, it might be as much as a week ago. Um, but that's the latest version that's available of EasyFile. So this report doesn't display any values. It's really useful in establishing what your errors are going to look like in EasyFile if you just load it at disk. How do we get it? So again, we're assuming that you have some knowledge of how the system works. So you're going to log in, you're going to go to your report section, you're going to go and find the tax certificate um, exception summary, um, you're going to select your payroll, and you're going to move through the steps and you're going to select obviously the current tax year because you don't want to report on last tax year. And then you're going to get to the screen, which is your option screen. And as you know, Sabo know that your option screen is normally where all of the things that, that are really pertinent happen. So here you'll see the reporting type. You will have interim up to the first six months. You will have full year, which is the situation we were looking at now, where you'd be pulling your full year. Um, but out of interest, you can also run the report on a monthly basis. And then all you do is you just say up to the last um, accepted payslip. So that means that after you've run your March run, you could do the first step of your validation for your next tax year as well. Okay, so that's just what's there. Your exception types, there's a whole list of different types, addresses, ID numbers missing, all those sorts of things. Now you can either leave it as multiple or you can use the little green button, select which ones you want to have a look at. So if you're focusing today specifically on ID numbers that are missing, you could just select that one and get the report out. And that's what the report comes out as. It's got your employee code, it's got your um, certificate number that the certificate's been generated, and it says the employee is mandatory data in the tax. So they're going to try and give you information as to what you have to fix, as well as just telling you that something is missing. We can also use the personal information update form. So this is a uh, a nice one for preemptive strikes, shall we call them? 
Um, to run the report, the list is there. We go to reports, we select our report, we move through the cycle, and then we generate our report, much like you would for any other kind of report. And this is what the report looks like. At the end of the day, what you can do with this report now is if you have an individual who has an address missing, like, uh, or, you know, whatever the information may be, um, you can then either print this or send it to them and ask them to complete the report. It gives you the information that the system he has for the individual, as well as a place for them to update that information. It may be prudent for you to do this on a regular basis, maybe once a year or twice a year, just to make sure that people have actually updated all of their personal information. And then we get to the financial aspects which is then our EMP501 and our EMP501 reconciliation. So we use these ones, obviously, to check our financials. We should be using the 501 to check against our declared liabilities on the EMPSA or EMP201s, whichever one you happen to have. Um, and we must make sure that not only does the PAYE balance, but the SDL and the UIF as well. When we look at the ETR recon, there we're going to look at how much ETR has been claimed as what the payroll says, as well as looking at what using another report, the ETR details report, to see what was on payroll and then using that in comparison to the 201s to see how much was actually claimed via SARS. Okay. In the perfect world, as you run this report, you will see that you've claimed X value on the 201s your X value on the detail report and the same X value is now pulling through to your EMP501. We can always hope. Um, it's not as bad as I make it sound out, uh, as I make it sound. Um, lots of companies get nice, clean information through and there's no issues. There's just when we do have ETI, they tend to be fairly nightmarish. So what does our 501 look like when we pull it out? So here we can see a 501 has been pulled out from the system. It's got all of our totals. It shows us what our PAYE, our SDL, and our UIF is. And it shows us what um, we can capture in here, the total number of the total value of our payments. Um, so that you can then use that to compare to make sure your 201 value or this column here, you could put in your 201 values. And you would then be able to see that balance on a monthly basis. And if you balance monthly, then annually you should then obviously match as well. On the ETR recon, we see it's an extra column there for us, um, although it's, these columns are significantly different. Um, this one is reflecting only PAYE. It doesn't show us SDL and UIF. And it gives us the ETR claimed column, as well as a brought forward and carry forward column, and then a net PAYE for that period. And that net PAYE on the period should be what is declared on your 201 before, uh, sorry, after SDL has come off. So your 201 has multiple areas to complete, one of those being PAYE declared. Uh, oh man, silly words missing in my brain today, is your, your PAYE uh, declaration value, and then you have an e, less ETI, and then you have a final value. So those are your different columns that are there, your PAYE, your SDL, your employment equity, your ETI incentive taken away, and then your net PAYE at the end. Again, these should then tie back to your payments. And when we move on to our next report, which is our, our detail report, We've got all the people who've claimed ETR for a period, and then we've got each of our months going across and a total for each month. So then we can make sure that our ETR balances. This report is also useful for where we need to make sure that we've claimed ETR for the correct individuals. Okay, So we can pick ages, so there's our age column. We can see that the ages are correct. Obviously, they should be within the range, so they should be basically over 18 and under 29. Um, number of ETR occurrences. If somebody is at the 25th occurrence, they should not have any ETR in that period. And then we need to look at our remuneration and the ETR claimed. So it should be within the ETR parameters there as well. And again, the ETR claim should be within the required parameters. For those of you who are very observant, you'll notice that this ETR report is from some time ago. 
and uh, if our values are not to the current variables. And this is where I'm going to hand over to Charlene, and she will run you through the VIP SCBPP reporting now. Charlene, over to you. Morning, all. Okay, if I got the ability to drive this. You need to change to, to share for your, your slides. So you need to share your screen now. <laughs> okay, but it's not allowing me to share, sorry. <laughs> okay, let me do that and you should be able to do it now. Okay, just hold on a moment. Sorry, I thought I was going to just move on with your presentation. Mm, I, I can carry on for you. I can click on, but I can't uh, allow you control on my machine. Does okay, just sense? hang on two seconds. I will quickly just get to my apologies for this. There we go. Uh, Cole, could you just actually then run through it? Sorry, because no I've, I've, I've basically shut everything down on my PC apart from mm -hmm. that. No problem. I'm going to click onto my share again and share it. And there you go. So we're going to move on to the next slide. There we go. Morning, all. I'm going to just basically run through the standard processes on Sage VIP Premier as well as SBCPP. As you are, as those of you are aware that has been using Sage for quite a while, they have a very nice functionality tool or a utility tool to sort of like streamline your tax year end and mid year end submission process. Next slide, please. There we go. Our general note here is we please ensure that you're on version 5.9B as at the end of February. VIP Premier, you create a copy system. Uh, before you roll over into your March period, it's imperative to keep the copy systems safe and secure, preferably in a different space or, an, or keep a second copy. As we've seen in recent months that there's been quite a few backdated queries going back to 2017, 2018, where there was not an issue, but there was no secure, secure check to ensure that any directive codes were captured correctly. And we've had quite a few people come back with instances where resubmissions have to be done. And as we all know, a lot has happened between 2018 and 2022 with COVID and our whole process changing and the way we do things have changed. And a lot of companies have in essence downscaled and certain processes were most probably not followed with regards to these very important backups. And we've had to do quite a few resubmits and assist people with resubmits on this to actually get the correct directive numbers in. On SBCPP, it will create an automatic backup when you do have a start new period and you will have a separate instance that you log into slightly differently to actually access your tax year end data as well as your tax year end processes. Which, is very, which I find is a lot easier and a lot nicer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Apologies. Some parallel information is used when exporting the IRP5 files and errors can arise if the data is incorrect. Each step here requires you to check and validate the payroll information to eliminate errors with the final upload process. That is why I also enjoy or prefer using the utility set up by Sage for this. And the purpose of this utility is to assist the user with the successful completion of this, as well as almost forcing you to keep the required reports and documentation, which we sometimes skip over when we're in a hurry. Next slide, please. This is what the preparation and submission process screen looks like with various steps. For those of us that have a little bit of OCD, there's a tick box process as well, which you can actually tick as you go through it to help you help remind you where you are in this and give you a nice sense of fulfillment when you reach the last step and can do your submission. There's also a checklist print and there's a link to quick support videos during the process. You can start the process, move through it and go back at any point in time. Next slide, please. 
The first step is always to validate your company information. This is quite useful just to addresses and all details are correct. Also very useful is things like people's email addresses, especially if you've had some staff turnover in your organization during the year or during the previous tax year and this has not been updated. There's nothing as horrible as suddenly waking up and going, I don't know why I'm not getting my EDIC file submission confirmations, and actually it's still going to a person that left six months ago and an email address that is no longer valid. Next slide, please. Validating company information. The following information has to be validated. Company registration, trading, registra registered and trading name, company information, trade classifications useful for ETI and very important. Ensure that all your company's PAYE numbers are correct. Sometimes when you add a new company during the year, if you split entities or if you actually split organizations, say for instance, going from a just a main payroll run as well as a weekly run and then suddenly incorporating incorporating for instance an exec run sometimes when you copy things across you don't always copy all the details correctly or you miss something there's also an override functionality that you can actually just type in 0000 or 7000 for your paye number and then when you get to this part of the process and you need to actually then tie or consolidate reports things won't work also important to have the correct RP5 contact person and information in as we found that emails sometimes get sent to entities or to people that are no longer within the organization and nobody knows why nobody is receiving the notifications. Next slide, please. The period info box, very important to make sure that you are in the correct period that you're doing this process in the relevant instance. Some of us fly off and have actually start doing the process in the main, in your main payroll run and then can't understand why nothing is working. Also very important to compare that or to ensure that, for instance, your wages are in correct weeks, that it's week four or four or week five or five. Ensure the tax year in tick box is completed, which will mean that you are actually at the end of your cycle in your relevant companies. Next slide, please. So validate your IRP5 information, which is your second step. You can also run your validate IRP5 information report prior to starting this process, which as Carl also mentioned previously, is quite useful to do this, for instance, say in the beginning of February or at the end of January, as soon as you've completed your January payroll process, because this will help you to be to to actually pick up what major challenges or what missing information you've got within your system so it, it just alleviates that first hurdle that you that you encounter in the process as because as we know it is sometimes like pulling hen's teeth to actually obtain information from staff sometimes the physical addresses is like se secret they don't really want to share with it for some unknown reason. It's not like we're going to come and visit them at home. Next slide, please. Should there be any outstanding information, the following will pop up on a report and then you can generate that and obtain the relevant information from your staff. As you can see, tax numbers that are mandatory, that it will, again, not prevent you from submitting, but it will give you warnings and it, it won't fail your validation. But as Carl also mentioned, this is at some point in time, SARS is going to actually start penalizing us for not having this information. Next slide, please. Your, your validate additional information screen, it's things like tax status, UIF status, always important to maybe just check your UIF status at um, especially with regards to people that have, for instance, returned from maternity leave and has not been flagged or unflagged from the legally retired employees, employees flagged for foreign income, employees flagged for manual certificates, especially in the case of we in, in a case where you may have had somebody pass away during the year and you've had to actually issue a manual certificate in order to assist the family to wrap up their estate. 
terminations during the year, employees with tech and company contribution screens, perks, tech values, and bursaries. The report will generate an Excel. It's very useful to keep on record and assist the administrator in validating the details for the employees. For any changes to e employee info, you can also use your Flexi Fix imports to import the information for the relevant employee changes. Next slide, please. Another very important step is your retirement fund validation. We're finding more and more that information is not tying up between what is happening on payroll and what is actually happening at our third parties. Next slide, please. This is what the report looks like. It's very useful to have on record. It actually gives you the scheme name, the type, etc. cetera, um, reference codes, all of that, which is quite useful, shows you who is on which scheme. It's a nice report to keep on file for audit purposes as well. Next slide, please. A retirement fund listing spreadsheet will display all your employees with all their retirement fund details. Important to ensure that all employees are correct are linked to the correct scheme codes. Ensure that your types of schemes is correctly set up with your, your defined contribution, defined benefit, as well as hybrid funds. Ensure that your actual contributions to the funds are accurately reflected, as this is the value that's going to be exported to your IRP5 and your file to SARS. And if this does not tie back with the IT3 that the individual receives from their fund, the employee may have to either pay in a tax year in which leads to unhappiness. We find that sometimes things fall through the cracks, especially if people do additional contributions. So that's just always a little red flag is to ensure that the additional contributions are paid over correctly and timelessly to the relevant fund so that this will reflect as a benefit for them. Also on a side note, HR Talk does offer the reconciliations to our clients of the retirement funds, as well as the management of portals to assist and ensure that this is tied up on a monthly basis. Next slide, please. The basic reconciliation procedure, the EMP 501 reconciliation report is a recommended report to print at tax year end. It summarizes your PAYE, SDL and UIF for each month in the tax year. Next slide, please. It generates a very nice user-friendly Excel report. You can also print this from the history reports, EMP 501 validation reconciliation as an alternative to do this maybe beforehand. The yellow columns can then be populated with your EMP SA values with what has been paid over to SARS and you can have a nice snapshot of what has happened during the year and you can pick up any variances quickly. I would suggest also doing this as a preemptive check as at the end of January to see that to see that everything has been paid over correctly, that you haven't missed anything, and that you can then actually do any corrections or adjustments in your February pay run to mitigate any short payments. Next slide, please. Should you have any differences, determine where the variances on payroll are. Start by identifying which employees are affected as well as which period is affected. There is three reports that you can print here. Your 12-month report, your history report, as well as your ETI history report. Best practice would be to print these reports in any case, even if you do not have any differences. And the reason sometimes for not balancing is if changes have been made in the tax year after your EMP 201 reports have been printed and submitted to SARS, and you have therefore not paid over the correct liability. Um, a way to prevent this from happening is once you have actually concluded your payroll, is by setting the stop further entry function once you've printed your reports. And then this in essence locks the payroll for any changes until you then actually remove the stop further entry and that actually prompts you to then reprint the reports mentally. This is 
These changes can include terminating an employee after printing reports or adding a new employee lastminute.com, changing the when taxable common col uh, column on the earnings definition screen, changing employee information as IRP5 start dates, tax statuses, while you're basically, for instance, reviewing, say, your final reports, but you've already handed your EMP 201 to finance or you have already uploaded that. Another area of caution would be loading updates in incorrect periods. I'm not sure if you've noticed that when you actually roll into a period or load an update, it always warns you to only do this prior to running any reports or running your payroll or closing off payroll. This is very important because there is sometimes recalculations that happens in the back end and it's small differences but can lead to major headaches later along the line. Also changing an employee to average or to normal tax after printing your reports, changing the provisions for tax on annual bonus, as well as adjusting values on the history screen. This is something I would not recommend as you cannot always, as you, as you don't always remember what you've done and can lead to complications along the line. I personally do not recommend changing anything on the history screen during the course of the tax year, only as an adjustment at tax year end. Next slide, please. This is what the 12 month report looks like. Next slide, please. Just a sample of the screenshot when you do the history report, a quick solution to not actually go and tick, 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 tick everything is just tick the bottom where it says items included in tax reconciliation. Next slide, please. Also imperative, include terminations as well as detailed report and then print the months that you have the issue in. Otherwise, you're going to have a massive, massive report. Compare the amounts on the history screen reports to the original EMP 201 report for each period and determine which or why employee records were changed. Were these changes correct? Was it just a quick test or check that you were doing for someone to do a, for instance, a, often we get last minute requests, HR needs to do a dummy pay slip or wants to see a prospective scenario because the person's package may be changing. You quickly do it in this instance and you don't change it back and you suddenly only realize it in the next month and then you go, oh crap, let me fix it. But you don't actually, you, you sort of like forget that you've actually got a tax implication instead of actually amending this before you do your submission for the next month. Your values on your history screen will differ from values on the 12 month report if manual adjustments have been made in the history screen of the employee. If the saved values on the payroll are correct, then the differences will have to be paid or claimed from SARS. This is why I prefer doing this exercise based, um, as soon as you've done your January pay run, because it will mitigate any of this, and you can any short payments to SARS, and you can actually correct it in your February pay run. Next slide, please. There is also your ETI history report, very valuable to keep on record, as we find lately as well. As soon as you do a submission to SARS and you have ETI, there is always a request for additional information, and you can then. And one of the main questions is, did you claim ETI? Please advise what the ETI was based on. And you can therefore then submit this report with your additional, your, your um, payslip analysis to SARS. And this actually eases the, the query. It normally satisfies SARS. Next slide, please. We can now go and do the IRP5 IT3 report test run. You can do this from the, um, the utilities screen, or you can actually do this from your main menu or your reporting screen to do this. Select the action required for your IRP5 certificates at tax year end and select the tax year end and click continue. Next slide, please. This is how you do it via the report menu. You can select the action required for the IRP5 certificate of tax year end, and you can move and you can then actually 
do it via this as well if you want to actually not do this as part of your validation process or utility process. Next slide, please. You select the type of run, always do your test run first until all your errors have been resolved. Again, this will correct this or this will give you the standard errors and maybe not the updated errors, which is lurking in easy file, as Carl mentioned, due to differences in actual versions. And therefore, we recommend that you always do the test run first until you've actually pulled it in and have a past validation on easy file. You can do multiple or single companies. And by companies, we mean entities with the same PAYE registration number. For instance, having a main payroll, a exec payroll, and a wage payroll, all the same PAYE number can all be consolidated into one file to be pulled into easy file. Next screen, please. The multiple company selection screen can be used to include several companies on your IRP5 submission file. Do note, however, that you will require the password for every single company. And this will therefore basically mainly only be done by your main operator who, especially if you have an exec payroll that limited staff has access to. Next slide, please. Review your company details again, just as a double check. Next slide. It will, it will generate standard reports, a IRP5 IT3 recon report with a list of all the employees and their year-to-date values, a summary report as well, and then you can also print your tax certificates. You can do this either on black paper, pre-printed stationery, or blank paper with a watermark logo that you set up in the back end. Nice little option here for sorting purposes. You can do you, you can actually select to print your terminated employees first. Next slide, please. You can you select your destination for your IRP5 submission file. One of the very nice functions of using the utility submission process is it creates a folder where all these documents and files is automatically saved to in the instance, and it actually labels it as tax. So once you are once this process is completed or every time you need to go back, you can actually, all the reports will be in there. It will be auto downloaded in there and you can keep it for, ref, for further reference and copying and saving into a, a additional space. On SBCPP, this functionality is not available and it will automatically download into your downloads folder or alternatively, if you have set up a specific folder for all your prints and downloads to go to automatically. If you have multiple different entities on your instance, always remember to label your files accordingly. Very importantly, I like to use my company prefix in front. As you can see, it says test IRP521. I would then put in 01 test IRP5 and the year, just so that you can keep record because the files will override, especially on Premiere, as it dumps the files into that specific tax folder. Next slide, please. It will create the IRP5 CSV file and it can be imported and uploaded into the easy file system. It will also print the IRP5 and IT3 reconciliation automatically to PDF. Next slide, please. These are just the sample reports of what they look like. Always very useful to keep, especially for audit purposes. But also here is a sample of the test IRP5 that it will issue for the individual that you can keep on record 
with your actual submitted fold with your submitted RP fives that you download from SARS for reference purposes. Next slide, please. We're now ready to import into Easy File. Just a few general notes on it. Make sure your payroll file is saved on a local drive. And you always know what the file is called and the file extensions. You access Easy File and access the applicable PAYE database from the menu selection. And you can then import it and the following meshes will appear. Find the file and then pull it in. We are very happy when it says payroll file past validation, but was marked as test data because it means then that it's accepted everything and you can just go into your system, rerun the process, and then actually mark it as a live instance. Very important to note that on Sage, Premier and SPCPP, you can only have one live run. You can go and reset it, but again, it is a security or a precautionary barrier to pre prevent people from just automatically upload, just making changes and re-uploading without following the resubmission process. We are not covering a resubmission process in this session. However, feel free to reach out to us should you have any challenges with this. Next slide, please. You can, you can, this is where you see where it'll actually give you the options to do when you do your live run and you will then actually print your certificates for further reference and distribution to staff. If you're on Premier, you can upload it to the ESS. SBCPP unfortunately still do, doesn't have the functionality to upload the tax certificates. They are working on it. Next slide, please. There we go. If it has failed with mornings but was marked as test data, it means that you there is just minor information missing. It would most probably be in most instances things like your tax numbers, which means you can still go in, do your live run, pull it in, and it will accept it. Next slide, please. If your payroll validation fails, there is definite errors on the system. And we have found one of the common ones that I found now during the submission was that there was an, a, a client that had commission and gave staff car allowances and the earnings did not align properly. So we had to do a bit of a rework on that. Or there could be that you missed something with regards to retirement funding income, things like that you can then go you need to go and investigate the payroll file log and fix the errors on payroll and rerun the process and re-import the file accordingly next slide please and we're up to sage 300 thank you for your time if there's any questions you can just pop it in and we will res respond to it after the session thank you for your time Excellent. Thanks very much, Lolly. Okay, so up next, we've got our Sage 300 people. Um, and by this stage, you guys are getting pretty saturated with information. So we'll try to run through this um, as seamlessly as possible. Um, if there are any questions, as Charlene said, um, you can just either note them and ask us at the end, or you can post them into the chat and we will um, uh, look at them as soon as we finish the, um, as soon as we finish the session's formal presentation. All right, so moving into the Sage 300 space. Which reports do we use? So we use a validation report. Um, and to access that, we go onto the tax certificate export screen from the navigation pane. Um, we go to, the, to get there, we go to the export. Um, we'll got a, a little demo, I mean, not demo, a little um, screenshot of that a little bit later. So don't try and follow along directly in what I'm saying. Um, basically, we go, we find that the tax certificate export option, we select our company, we select our tax year, and then we've got some options that we can choose. So at this stage, we want to have a look at validation. So we're going to select the, um, to reconcile the, the validation. So we're going to select the validation run option, and then we're going to click on export. Uh, once the, the report is run, we can right-click on it anywhere and save that PDF. 
this is in essence what that screen looks like. So we're going to go to exports, we're going to put a certificate export, we're going to select our company in our tax year, we're going to say we want a validation, and then we're going to click on and it's been cancelled from here. But up at the top and around this area here, sorry, around this area here, I'm showing on the wrong screen. Um, around the, which should be unfortunately it's been cut off, is the export to CSV file. Once that's run and been saved, this is the report that will be generated for you. So as you can see, very similar to all the other um, parts of the system or other systems we've looked at today, it's giving you an idea of um, what validation errors there are on your file. Obviously, at that stage, you want to go back and correct those. So this one is actually quite interesting and quite nice in that it also gives you things like your RP5 contact information is missing. Now, that means that there is company data that is missing. So there we go. We've got to check our company data. We've got to go back and make our updates onto the system and then go and rerun the report until we are getting either errors that we can't repair. So perhaps somebody has no tax reference number um, or we're happy with the ones that we're getting, the, the recons that we're getting. And then we can move on and we're going to also have a look again. How do we look at our employee master detail? Here we can go to our employee master detail report. We go and expand reports. We click on all reports. We expand employee section. Double click on EMPDETL, so that's the report name. Click on preview and then we can export it to PDF. I mean, yeah, to PDF. You could also export this to Excel, but it's going to be a very messy Excel. You don't particularly want to report in Excel. And it gives you an opportunity to check all things like the employee's name, um, dates of birth, all the other information that we've spoken about previously that we need to validate and make sure it's correct. Sage 300 also allows us to use the scheduler at the stage to email that detail report to each individual to allow them to verify their details. Okay, so you can follow the steps there. We expand our scheduler, we go to our scheduled tasks. We complete a new task or we, a new scheduled task. We select that we want to send this um, employee details report out, um, and then we can then send that out and schedule it to go out. What's nice, obviously, with the Sage 300 scheduler is that you can schedule this beforehand. So you can say schedule this to happen once a year, once a month, whatever the situation may be, and you can configure it and allow it to then function autonomously. So every time that that occurrence um, happens, it will send out the um, details forms to the employees. That's really nice with the scheduler. Obviously, you have to be licensed in the scheduler and your scheduler has to be running. But when we start getting into the financial information within Sage 300, we often need to go back and rebuild the tax monthly total data or the tax total monthly. Um, just depends on how your brain works and switches words around. To do this, we would go to the company management, the tax total monthly. We'll click on the applicable month, click on the detail, and then click on rebuild. So why would we do this? Well, if for any reason something has changed after the 201 has been paid away, so ETI has changed, we've got to recalculate the 201 because there's been a backdated change, um, any of those reasons, and that will allow the, the 201 to be rebuilt for the 501 declaration. Remembering if you are doing this, and as Charlene has said beforehand, and as, as some of the other parallel softwares don't allow you to do, um, but the Sage 300 product does, is that if you are making backdated changes or changes to a period where you have already paid away to SARS, you need to make sure that in the next month that you are making the update um, to the 201, sooner rather than later. We don't want to be in a situation where at the end of a tax year, you're coming through to go and figure out that you paid Joe Soap an extra 200 rand bonus in April. And now the PAY is due on that. And now you have penalties and interest because you short declared seven months ago. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that the, the system requires you to keep on top of. So if we move on, we can see 
these is, this is our EMP501 report, and this obviously we would use for our balancing purposes. So once we've done our recalculation of our tax, um, it's prudent to probably do that anyway to make sure the system has the latest values. We can then go and pull our 501 report to go start our checking on our financial information. And that's it for here. Basically, we go to our exports. We go to this tax certificate option where we were before. Um, but this time, instead of saying we want to do a validation, we go to our 501 report. So we select there. It is there, our 501 EMP 501 report only. And again, we can export it. And this time, instead of um, PDF, we're going to select CSV option. Result looks very much like the stage um, VIP report and allows similar functionality in that we can actually capture into that the POIE values, the UIF values, and the SDL values that were paid. And we can then use this report to check and to sum up our balancing to make sure that everything has balanced. Where we have reconciling differences, the reports that we can use to go and have a look at those. Now you'll see a lot of similarity. Obviously, the Sage products have been developed by the same business. And as a result, they tend to follow very similar lines of these sorts of things. So we can use the pace of the period analysis or the employee 12-month report. So if we want to use the uh, period analysis, we can go to the all reports to payroll and to that P-R-D-A-N-A-R-E-P. Um, very horrible names. Remembering it does, obviously, if you know Sage 300, have a long and a short description as well, which will say period analysis in it. Or alternately, you can run the 12-month report for the individual or for any group of individuals, and we would do that very similarly. We would go to the all reports, to payroll, and then to the EMP 12-month, um, and that will be able to give you the 12-month report. We can then compare that report to the tax total monthly report. Um, which we would have been printed. And ideally, you would want to be printing your tax total monthly report uh, on a monthly basis, extracting it on a monthly basis, so that you have that information at hand. But obviously, you can go and do it again um, at the end of your cycle anyway. Okay, we've been through these at uh, uh, quite extensively during the course of this presentation. But in essence, the differences or the potential reasons for these are there's a provision for uh, bonus tax. That is not correct. So there's something you need to check and there's something that's available for you to check. Um, the date of birth of an employee. So potentially um, something's been captured incorrectly and the person's either receiving or not receiving the additional um, tax benefit of being over 65 or in the next bracket. Engagement date or the RP file start date are not where it should be, and or the termination date of the employee is not what it should be. In other words, the tax period is incorrect. Um, the average and normal tax setting and the tax type fields on the on the earnings screens, th these are fairly dangerous in, in that if you set somebody to not use the proper averaging or, or the normal tax um, settings, and you haven't picked it up by this stage, there is definitely going to be a variance in the amount of tax that is going to be paid. So please, it's something you should be rather checking on a monthly basis. If you notice that somebody who's normally earns, um, you know, X value and all of a sudden they're earning significantly more um, and the tax is reduced, then potentially there's something there that needs to be investigated. The tax type field on the earnings screen or on the deduction screens Often these are, are clicked in error or they've been changed in error. So there are things to go and have a look at. So under your deductions, you shouldn't really be seeing any real tax implication on your deductions other than obviously for uh, provident fund, I mean, pension provident fund or retirement funding. Um, but that's normally shown in a separate field as well. So um, you would need to go and have a look at those. The tax definition screen, again, if you've selected something incorrectly on the employee's detail, it can kick up there medical aid history screen, and or beneficiaries. Across payrolls, this is probably the biggest area of um, uh, where people pick up where they have to pay in is a beneficiary, a number of beneficiaries has changed during the course of the year and they've informed the medical aid, but they didn't inform payroll or something else happens and it didn't get captured in payroll. So instead of only having um, two beneficiaries because they're 
eldest child you know, is no longer on their medical aid. They've been receiving three beneficiaries and now they're gonna to have to pay that tax in at the end of the year. Yeah. Not necessarily anything that can be done about that, but um, it is something to be checking for if you're seeing that there's imbalances. Taxable earnings on the payslip screen, taxable perks and taxable deductible amounts all on the payslip screen. Um, and this it would indicate that somebody has physically overridden or um, manually adjusted the taxable earnings. Very dangerous practice. Please, if you can avoid that, please do that. Don't, don't be making changes to taxable earnings. Um, now, all of these things, taxable perks and tax deductible amounts, these are all just variations of the same theme in that they all form part of your taxable earnings, or as Sage likes to call it, your balance of remuneration. Now, if you're making changes to those manually on screen, um, th that would uh, indicate that you have a very high level of confidence in your ability to make those calculations yourself. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly dangerous stuff. And you're almost always going to end up uh, with a headache later on in the tax year. So if it can be avoided, I would suggest that you avoid that. When we need to reconcile ETR values, then again, we're going to go and pull out a customer or not a customer report, a standard report for it. And that report is under the all report section, um, under the payroll section, and then you select the ETR detail report. Um, and you can then look at that as in comparison to the monthly tax total report. ETR report will apply. So, and it gives us um, a couple of bits of information. So it shows us the ETR remuneration, the ETR that has been taken, the qualifying months, and the number of hours that has been there for. So we can see quite quickly why somebody has A, had, had ETR, or B, has not had ETR. So for argument's sake, in this report, you can see at the end, um, the, the two of the people, the only two people that actually qualify for ETR, um, the ETI is out of the range. In other words, they are not in the ETI, um, ETI bracket from a earnings perspective. And the other one, the ETI cap has been reached. So, um, you know, just trying to give you guys some different errors or different reasons that will pop up there. And here we go, we can see our last report. Again, we're going to compare the, these total values that are in here, the ETI total value to what is showing up on it. Um, and then we would then, once all these things are all done nicely, we now have a nicely validated um, disk that we can now load into easy file. And we've followed similar steps to what Charlene ran through on her side. We're gonna skip right there. And that's pretty much where I came to an end um, with the information that we've been um, going over today with the Sage 300 and with our cyber and Charlene's uh, running through of this, the other Sage products, the CPPP and the VIP and Premier. I'm going to uh, share on now, but if there are any questions, if you will either, uh, you can either unmute yourself and um, I believe you can unmute yourself. You open up the participants. Yes, I believe you can. Um, you can either unmute yourself and ask your question, or if you're not comfortable doing that, either pop it into the chat and go into the Q&A section. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions. Is, um, is that accurate? Is everybody comfortable with what we did today? Um, great, Charlene, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? No, nothing from my side. Okay, then, excellent. 
Plus, please remember you do have our email addresses um, or you have the info at HR Talk. If you have any queries, we'd like to get into contact with either Charles or myself. Um, we can use that route and we will get back to you as soon as it's humanly possible. But barring that, thank you very much for your time today. Over to our final slide. Just to say thank you and have a lovely afternoon. Not yet, have a lovely morning. Thanks very much, guys.